remember arriving at Heathrow to go to Australia and I started sitting around the senior players and I started pestering them, asking them about Warney, asking them about McGrath, what's it like to play against this great Australian side. And I always remember hearing kind of the messages back and I remember looking at them going, what the fuck are we getting on this plane for? They're new to Australia, um, so I think they play what, probably two matches between them. So very inexperienced, but a uh, lot of raw talent. They hate us, simple as that. And we, you know, are not that fond of them either. I don't care if, how really how we get on about anybody else. The only series that really matters is the Ashes. Doesn't matter how you go against anybody else. Does not matter. I'd gone pretty well up leading up to that sort of time. There was comments in the media from Australian players about, you know, how they're going to target me and how they were going to approach it, which has never been done before then. What's going on here? You know, there's a different war happening here. It's in the air. That's well taken. Justin Langer. Point. Michael Vaughan standing his ground. Justin Langer caught me at Adelaide. Steve Buckner is the man at the bowler's end, and he's calling the third umpire. As soon as it went upstairs, you kind of laughed inside, and I'll get away with this. That, to me, is out. That's straight into the hands and out. It was caught. It was out. Not out, Michael Vaughan. Got away with it, got 177, and, and my Ashes career just went from there. You know, I always remember all the Australian team, and they all came and shook my hand apart from Justin Langer. Or oh, we held grudges. <laughs> <laughs> I used to think Michael Vaughan was the biggest knob in the world. Armisen, 150, and there's another one. Oh, it could have gone anywhere. Struck him on the body. I remember in 2003, we'd struggled our ass off, and we were about 60 or 70 at lunch, and that was very unlike Haydos and I. It's a better shout, bit of length, too. Haydos walks down to me and goes, Mate, if this was a fucking one day, I'd be walking at this man, and I'm hitting him back over his head for six. I said, Well, fuck, get out of your system, mate. This is. The second session of the Boxing Day test, and he walked and hit Craig White back over his head for six. Oh, how good is that? Goes a long, long way. Straight over his head. I was like, you can't do that. <laughs> it's a test match. How dare you? There's a number of us that would have looked at the Australian team as inspiration more than the England team. And Steve Wars running between the wickets, being aggressive, have that red handkerchief in the back pocket. Steve, congratulations. Uh, obviously, the Ashes, very important to Australian and English cricket, and uh, you've retained them. Yeah, look, it's fantastic to win it uh, in the first three tests. The way we've played, it's been pretty comprehensive, and uh, the, the side's been outstanding. I built the way that I played around Australian way of playing. I wanted to be them. When Michael then took over being captain, that was the biggest implementation that they put in place. Michael Vaughan and Duncan Fletcher were the instigators of what we needed to do, and we have to fight fire with fire. And I rang my dad and I said, uh, Dad, I've just been given the England Test captaincy. And he just went, he said, they must be in fucking dark times. <laughs> Michael Vaughan convinced England that they were not just better than average, but very good. He put together a strong, fast bowling attack. He made flint off the talisman. He chose people who were ready for a hardcore cricket. I got to play a lot with Mark Taylor and then Steve War, and it was just passed down through the generations of what it meant to be playing against England. Ricky Ponting will be appointed as Stephen War's successor. Looking back to a lot of junior sides, I was, I was always captain in those junior sides, and, and it was something that I always dreamt of doing. I was exceptionally excited about what it meant. Captaincy is an extension of your personality and how you deal with people and handle people, how you see the game. I used to joke that the two most important <laughs> jobs in Australia were Prime Minister and the Australian cricket captain. They have a status in the country that I think is just a little bit above any other sportsman or woman. I've always said Prime Minister is the biggest job and then England cricket captain for profile and for what people are looking at and expecting from those individuals. Punner's a feisty little character. He was quite young when I first met him. I think he was 16. He was betting on the Greyhound dogs and so I nicknamed him Punner. You know, I was at the Cricket Academy as a 15-year-old and you're starting to learn all about Ashes cricket then. Everything starts getting a bit tingly. Just my hands and a little bit of a tingle down my spine. And, and the major reason is it's just different. Ashes cricket is just different than any other cricket that you play. The Ashes baggy green cap probably sums up my whole life, really. I remember reading an article Mike Catherton wrote about, you know, sort of this thing about the baggy green cap. What a load of rubbish. Like, it's just... Really? Tell a kid there's no Father Christmas. 
Listen, Australia's got no history, so they have to try and hang the hat on something, literally. For us, it's about playing for England. If they play for Baggy Green, fine, we play for England. It's so much more than a cap. It's so much more than a piece of fabric. The moment you get a Baggy Green is the moment you have made it. Oh, my Baggy Green, oh. Oh, I've got tear in my eye, my Baggy Green, oh, my Baggy Green. You stick it up your arse for me. It's a cap, man. Pull yourself together, it's just a cap. It is just a cap, but it isn't. Couldn't really give a crap what any English thinks about the baggy green. They're just jealous that they don't have one. They can jog on. I think the baggy green and all that stuff is a load of rubbish. You don't need to wear a baggy green cap to say you love playing cricket for Australia. I mean, Bill Laurie used to clean out the pigeon loft with his, wearing his Australian cap just to keep the pigeon shit from getting in his hair. <laughs> All of a sudden, Steve Wall made them important, so I scrubbed it up pretty quick. <laughs> we get the sense that Justin Langer just wears it 24-7. I think they arrived at Wimbledon. I'll do a fucking tennis event with a cap on. Well, here with a couple of Australians, in fact, a whole team of Australians. Fantastic to have Pat in this final. I was in regular contact with Pat Raff's brother, Pete, who was organising tickets. Gilly, I managed to get you into the royal box, but it means you have to put on jacket, tie, and all that. Hang on a minute, mate. Boys, it's in the royal box, yeah! We've got to put on ties. So... No! <laughs> it's great to be here supporting him. We've got the Aussie spirit, got the caps on, and, uh, yeah, everyone's really keen to see him get up for a win. We've rocked him with our baggy greens on. What an absolute joke. Me and Mark Wall refused. I think Flem refused as well because we thought, no, that's stupid. We look like idiots. What were they thinking? Oh, embarrassing. I mean, what is that all about? <laughs> if I had my time again... <laughs> I'm not 100% sure. In fact, I probably am. I'm probably 100% sure I probably wouldn't have worn it. Maybe it would have been better to leave it in the kit bag. But I love the baggy green. It's too cringeworthy for me, right? Now, Steve Wall, astute man, loves his baggy green. There has to be fallout. You know what? I never played another test match. I should have wore the baggy green. Paddy Rafter, you cost me an Australian test career. London bound, Ricky Ponting eager to begin his first Ashes tour as captain. You know, there's extra incentive for me, I guess, as well, being the, my first uh, Ashes tour as captain. We spent 12 months working out who Australia were. We wanted to know what makes them tick. And that was the great thing that we had, I think, as a team, was the mystique we had around a lot of our players. I didn't want anyone to know about us. You know, I had some good information about every single player. Who from? I can't possibly say. If we play against that Australian team of what we've seen and read, we're knackered. You'll go to bed at night frightened. I said, we find out who they are, and then you realise they're just humans. They'd heard time and time again that this English team might be a match for them. And I think deep down, they probably didn't buy into that. Deep down, I thought, oh, I think we're right here. I think we'll be right. Hopefully win the, the first hour of the first day, then uh, everything should be OK for us. Just got to win. Just got to beat them. Doesn't matter what it takes. You know, the history... The definition of your career, both as a team, personally, you just know the Ashes series will define you. Tension and the build-up to this game, something I've never before seen, or felt for that matter. The atmosphere here on the first day, I'd almost call it tribal. It was a ground that, even with Australians in it, felt like it wanted Australian blood. Yeah, you're nervous. Oh, you're probably more nervous for an Ashes test than, than any other. And then the moment you get your, your blazer and your cap on and you walk through the long room to toss up and the roar for the Ashes, now the England captain's walking out and it's a roar, he's like, oh, shit, here we go. Michael Vaughan leads out England, listen to this. That was your moment as a captain. That is one of the, the skills of leading an Ashes team, is like, can you act at that crucial moment when the camera's on, it's glaring on you? Can you be the coolest cookie in town? Can you portray this message to your team that actually this doesn't matter, but it does? Those two opening batsmen would have felt a twinge or two of nerves. Here's Harmison. Steve Hunt runs and bowls the first ball, flies past. But what happened next was unbelievable. The slips start walking at me, the point starts walking at me, bat pad walking at me. And like, these guys are all over us. And I mean, Hados walks down to me and goes, mate, mate, these boys are serious, be sharp. 
Steve Armas and the message just being bowl as quick as you can, mate. Yeah. And then I just got hit for the first time that I can ever remember hitting the helmet. He got cut under his eye. They all came in and swarmed like a pack of dogs. I'd never seen that from an England side before. Ricky getting hit on the head. Really? No one hits Punter in the head. Blood pouring out and him just sort of swatting it off as though it wasn't a problem. Did this side here somewhere? Yeah. He was as tough as old boots. Went to a plastic surgeon that afternoon though to make sure he <laughs> didn't lose my good looks. <laughs> That's lovely cricket. That's hey. out. He's gone, six down, 126. Well, that's got to be Clark, that's got to be out. Yes, he's gone. Plum LBW, Harmison has struck again. Start of the day, that you said that uh, we'll have the Aussies back in the pavilion for 190. I think they would have said that'll do us just fine, thank you very much. That is only the beginning of the saga that is the Ashes. 190 all out Australia is brilliant for England. It's important that the England batsmen don't throw it away. And Glenn McGrath has got the ball. He's on 499 wickets. In the air, out. Got it. That's 500 for McGrath. Wonderful cricketer. Brilliant bowling. First ball off to T. Glenn McGrath has 500. I took the catch. Marcus Tresco, I think. Oh, yes. I think he had some fancy boots with, a, with gold 500 or something. We were going, you, you are such a knob. McGrath is on song here at his very best. Oh, Flintoff gone too. Five for McGrath. McGrath demolishing us with a new ball, worn bamboozling us with a, a couple of deliveries. Yeah. It is really well bowled. They really believed they could beat Australia. And then England got hammered. And so you just thought, it's back to square one. It's no different from how it used to be. Australians have won this opening test match. England all out in their second innings for 180 in 58.1 overs. For guys that had played against Australia before, maybe some old wounds opened up a bit. We were shocking. We were scared. I think that a lot of the guys just thought, oh, it's the same old England. I, know, I probably shouldn't be saying this, but Justin Langer said, let's go into the England dressing room. And he pointed out to all the England players and said, you're whatever. And I just thought we're a bit too cocky. Went into their change rooms to sing our team song at Lords. Late into the evening, they'd all cleaned out. Hey, the easy beats and throwing beer everywhere and drinking. Oh, God. Fucking arm in arm, we're lifting each other up. And then it's the song, and underneath the Southern Cross of Sand, a sprig of wattle in my hand, a native of our native land, Australia, you fucking beauty. <laughs> oh, looking back now, I wish we hadn't had as many beers as we had before we were down there. And we're sort of walking out thinking, hmm, might have been better doing that when we just re-retain the ashes. I'm not sure if the English actually know that we even did that. They might not, they might not to this day. I don't know, it's a karma in sport, isn't it? They'll probably look back and think, phew, that karma's bitten us on the arse here. Glenn McGrath rolling around in agony here. He stumbled on a cricket ball that was lying loose on the outfield. I was going, no! No, you want to grab any step, and he fell. And this is just before we're tossing the coin, remember? And he's out. And that's like, fuck. They look over at the palms, and they're all dancing. I've never seen a happier England team. I realised, I reckon, before I hit the ground that it, you know, I was out, of, out for this test match. Michael Vaughan and Ricky Ponting were ready for the toss. Here it goes. I remember going up to Punner saying, mate, please, just look at the pitch. It always turns, we bat first, and McGrath rolls his ankle. Surely now we're gonna bat. He'd made our mind up pretty much a day before. There'd been a lot of shitty weather around it. Heads is the call. It is a head, Ricky. Heads it is. And it's a head, and my eyes are gone, oh, shit. I go like this. Oh, we're gonna have a bowl this morning, mate, with the uh, overhead conditions. We'll bowl. Moment. Toss had been won by Australia. They've chosen to bat first. And in my ear, uh, no, the Australians are bowling first. They're putting in the bat. We'll see you after the break. 
the only way we could beat Australia is batting first, getting a score and potentially just giving them a tricky chase in the last innings. I couldn't believe it. Oh, look, I still think I made the right decision. came out like possessed, just got it in his trousers. I mean, he just smashed him. Shane Warne came on to bowl. I remember thinking to myself, right, we taught the talk, now you need to walk the walk. There he goes. Really good stroke from Strauss, but it sends a signal that England have rather changed their game plan. Trez whacked him over his head a couple of times as well. Oh, that's a terrific hit. And it kind of set the tone for, we're going to come at you. It's in the air. It's gone for six. It's a big six. It's gone back miles. By the end of that first day, England were believers. And the Australians were thinking, how did that go so badly wrong? Whispering a bit in corners. They should have batted. We had a batted. Who knows, it might have been different. And that's where I thought within our team for the first time, we had a few little cracks appear. We had a few little factions forming. With 2.35 to win the game for Australia, Michael Vaughan calls Andrew Flindorf into the attack. Flintoff is a colossus. He got me up first ball, and then he bowled this over to Punter. Oh, that's so close! Three out of three, bang, bang, bang. Then gets Punter out. That sort of stage in my career is probably when I was batting as well as I ever played, and, and I'm happily walking off saying, well, not much I can do about that. These are moments. These are my big moments. The second last night, I came out to bat, and Ashley Giles was bowling into the rough out here, and I sort of went to block one and hit me in the pad. Catch! Fielding at City Point, I thought, I've got to say something to him. And I said, come on, Jarlo, he's really struggling against you here. And I sort of just stopped and said, Straussie. You're kidding yourself, mate. It's these two eyes turned to me and went, mate, there's only one guy struggling around here. It's you, you fucking shit. <laughs> Pretty humiliating, to be honest with you, and you're kind of hoping your teammates back you up and, and everyone was sort of just not engaging in that conversation at all. And there was another bit to this, which I, I've never told, is he then turned around to me again and said, listen, mate, you say another word to me and I'll hit the next ball for six. And I went, all right then. Come on, Jarlow, he's really struggling against you here. Six, what a shot. Bang, over square leg for six. You gonna say it again, mate? Still need 107 to win, Australia. And England need those two wickets. Is there a sting in the tail? Warnie hit him everywhere, Brett Lee was hit everywhere. Whoops, there it is. Oh, he's hit him hard, yep. Jeez, being took some bruises. Oh, got him! Well done, Flintoff! Only played incredibly well, actually, and then tried on his stumps. Once again, little things that happen in games, you think back, so how has he done that? How's that happened? Oh, inside edge for four. And England supporters, head in their hands. And then it gets closer and closer and closer and closer, and it's like, oh, so close. Close to unwatchable, if you're English. Boys well, steered that on away. Oh, and there's a dive down at third man. And as soon as he spilled it, I went, fuck, that's it. Mm. We ain't getting another chance. Mm. I thought, we're gone now. I'd, we can't come back from this. Being able to lace this cover drive, I just thought, that's game over. But there's a deep point there. Two metres either side, it's game over. So close, so close. I'm standing here, he's just there, five yards away. And you can see it happening almost in slow motion as the ball comes over. And then it changes just like that. It's right back on again. It wasn't until we studied the replay that we worked out. The hand was off the bat um, when he hit the glove. If we had DRS then, time would have been different. DRS, unlucky, unlucky. Get on with it. It was late night. I think I still at school the next day and just watching and thinking, ah, oh, this sucks. It was the first time I actually felt what it was like 
to be a part of an Ashes team but not be a part of the Ashes team. One of my abiding memories will be uh, Freddie Frinsoff going up, putting his arm around Bradley. And when we talk about enmity, but actually it's not enmity, is it? There's an underlying love within cricket. It says a lot about Freddie. He'd taken what it all meant in the enormity of the event, Ashes cricket. All those memories of haunted English cricket for decades were just beneath the surface. And so to get one over them, it suddenly transported us into a completely different place. It's cruel, really, I think, to get, uh, to get so close. And, and... Packed to the rafters, Old Trafford, and some disappointed people outside the ground because uh, they're now turning people away. The gates are closed. This place is heaving. We left the hotel, 20-minute drive maybe to the ground. Every little side street down, getting into the Old Trafford was completely blocked. You could not get, we couldn't get the buses down. We just couldn't get in. If ever the legend of the ashes needed proving, you should have been there. My, wow, that was fantastic. Are you under pressure from the nation? There's a bit of a fever out there, isn't there? Oh, it's great. It's great for the game, and, you know, it's good that everyone's talking about cricket. Duncan Fletcher pointed to me in, in the morning and said, you're not enjoying this ash it's stressful, this ashes series. And as I go to toss up this little boy, and going to toss up with me. I mean, the little boy had gone through so many operations, and he walks to me and says, morning, mate. And he just looked at me and he went, why are you, why are you so miserable? I said, what do you mean? I said, well, you're not smiling. I said, you're right. I said, maybe I should smile. He said, yes, you should. You're playing cricket. And I just looked at him and went, God, he's right. Connor Shaw, our six-year-old mascot. Forget psychologists. He was my greatest psychologist, no question about that. Michael Vaughan has won the toss. Yeah, we're going to have a bat. There is an electric feel at Old Trafford. It was almost like going to the boxing ring. This could hurt. No! <laughs> oh. Plonked me pretty hard. That was a bad moment for Strauss. And that is an interesting place to be mentally. This is a, a moment in your life which you either come through or you take the easy option. Oh. Ooh, another beauty from Lee. Oh. I had to duck and weave and, and fend off a few. And then he bowled a slow ball, which is the last thing I was thinking of. Wonderful piece of bowling. Australia have the breakthrough. Ah, yes! Out! 600 test match wickets for Shane Warne. The 600th wicket was just arsy. Popped up, thanks very much, job done. And it was like, you are kidding me, you know? This is not fair. No wonder he's got 600 wickets when he gets those. It's a lovely shot from Warne. Australia. An Ashes century. Straight away, I don't know any player that doesn't go history. It was the back to Michael Vaughan that we needed, and it made the difference. The atmosphere defies belief. And who has it in them to draw blood in the Ashes series? And that went flat and hard. Oh, it's another magnificent strike. Well, that's a beautiful shot, and that uh, is Ponting's 23rd century, and it's his fifth against England. That's very well played. You know, you hear all these great things about entertainers, whatever. I just wanted to score runs, and I wanted to win games. Clintoff's going to bowl at uh, the Stratford end. This is going to be the real test of... The crowd could sense it. Oh, Freddie's on to bowl. You know, we've got to watch. Something's going to happen. That 
was the first time I felt truly under siege from an opponent. Wondering if I was a fraud, whether I'd faked it to get to that point in my career. I was gone in the head thinking, they've got me. I could see the finish line there. Like, I'd, I'd worked and worked and worked and got battered for, you know, most of that last day. Just flicked my glove and caught down the leg side, and then I'm thinking, oh, man, there's, there's, that's the game gone. Game's gone, and it could be the series gone as well. Thinking, you know, what have you just done? One solitary single ball. Here we are. Brett Lee has done it. Well, that's drawn series level one all. What a series. What an Ashes battle. When the test was saved, Michael Vaughan gathered the England players together. Let's take a look at them. So I've never seen this. So the Australians don't draw and celebrate. It was like a real pommy reaction. We were pumped. We were like jumping up and down like we just won the test. Yeah, they didn't see me, cos I was still tucked up in the back corner of the dressing room, hiding, because I got out with a couple of overs to go. The emotions that I went through that day, I don't think I went through ever. It's quite nice to see them jumping up and down, having a draw. I think as many teams have seen that in the last five or ten years. We only have to win one of the last till we retain the Ashes, so I believe the pressure's on England. At Trent Bridge in the fourth test, Australia found itself in the unaccustomed situation of following on 259 runs behind on first innings. England's tactic of rotating its quick bowlers, they went off for rest and came back on again, was working pretty well. They just kept rotating their bowls would go off, have a shower, get rubbed down, skull about three or four Red Bulls. It became very evident during that game, something was brewing. That's Gary Pratt of Durham. So Gary Pratt's been on for a considerable time while uh, other players have rotated and been off the field. We sat going, what's going on here? If you can't bowl 15 over spills, at 90 miles an hour, and then come back and do it again 20 minutes later. We knew it was winding him up, so I was going to carry on. What was premeditated was to have the best fielder in England there as our 12th man. He's quick, so they've got to be very careful. Quick, quick. Oh, he's gone, I think. Gary Pratt is the substitute fielder. Ricky Ponting's reaction as he walked off the pitch was like manna from heaven for us. It was like, we're getting to them here. I look up and see their coach with a big smile on his face hanging out from their balcony. We loved every single bit of it. I'm on the pitch pissing myself laughing. Ponting is the man going back to the dressing room. He's aggro. Whew. Mate, Punter would have loved to have been up there and swinging punches. I got my gear off pretty quickly and I was three quarters of the way up the stairs up into the, to their rooms to probably push him off the balcony. Yeah. <laughs> Someone followed me up, knew where I was going and dragged me back down pretty quickly. This fielding rotation, it seems to be getting under the skin of the Australians. Well, that's up to them. I mean, at the end of the day, if you hit a ball straight to cover and you get run out, what do you expect? 129, the figure for England. 10 wickets to take for Australia. What is in store for us in this uh, final session of play? Oh, crikey, we're going to go 2-1 up. We looked at it and got nervous. It was squeaky bum time. Oh, that is glorious. What a shot. The start was fine. Just Scothic played lovely strokes. And then punting through the ball to Warren. Gone! I reckon that's a bad pad it is. And he got to Scothic out, first ball. And he gets another. That's great bowling. But you do wonder. You do, because it's him. Oh, he's got him! He's got him! And he damn nearly pulled it off. And that's it. England go to a 2-1 lead in the series. And Australia now must win at the Oval if they're to retain the Ashes. I went to a box, one of the hospitality boxes. In the other corner, there was an old woman blubbing. I said, is there anything I can do to help? And she looked half up and said, my son's just hit the winning runs. And it was old Mrs Giles blubbing her heart out. And if we thought the country was on board, now they're riding the high seat. The ship's pulling out of the harbour and they're all trying to get to the Oval. Everything is at stake. 
England have not held the Ashes for 16 years and 38 days. And now the Australians down the steps of the grand old ground in South London. You're just sort of expecting to them and win. They've been good for a couple of games, but they can't keep doing it. The closer you get to that moment of greatness, you know, the harder it is. You know, it almost becomes further away from you. Andrew Strauss first, then Marcus Truscothic. Phenomenal noise. You're almost praying that, it, you know, that just go how we plan it to go this week. You know, just please. More runs for Strauss. That's a good shot. Oh, good shot. That's his hundred. This has been a superb night. Given what was on the line there, that was the best innings I ever played for England. I remember actually getting back to my room that night and getting a text message from Justin Lang just saying, well done, buddy, well played. That was a top knot, you know. Those sort of things mean a lot for you, especially when they're coming from the opposition. It was a struggle that reflected the entire series. England making a very competitive 350 plus. The England innings is over, 373 all out. But then Langer and Hayden finding form, both making centuries. 100 to Justin Langer, he's played really well. He carried the attack to England yesterday when it was so important. That is a very good hundred from Matthew Hayden. And the big fella just turned. He knew one of the lads had a niggle. He went, I'm bowling till they're out. Oh, again. Oh, what's out? Surely, yep, it's a slow death from Rudy Gibson, but it is a death. And he just bowled and he bowled and he bowled. It will be out caught. Shane Warren is out. Flintoff has struck again. And realistically, Ozzy should have had a 100-run lead, and that was down to Flintoff. There's the pace men again, but a real handful for the Australians. Bowled out the 367. England lead by six runs. This was a series of endless heroes. In this case, it was Kevin Peterson and Ashley Giles who staved off an Australian victory charge. It was that partnership between KP and Ashley Giles that really cost us. Gilly dropped one on naught off me. Oh, he's got, he's dropped it. Dropped it. I think he got an edge on that. And I dropped an absolute solo. Is that the moment or what? I remember cranking Brett Lee up. Just give me three or four overs of your vastest, shorter stuff. We'll rough him up. We'll play on his ego. We'll see what happens. Oh, and he didn't see that at all. Brett Lee was bouncing the shit. I mean, we are into him. I remember running from deep backwards square and all this wasting fucking time. Fucking get up, you weak prick. Peterson has got problems with Brett Lee. He was shitting himself at lunch. To Skip, he said, I don't know what to do. I said, take him on. I said, don't worry. I said, if we get half an hour of you, that's it done and dusted. Get him out there and hit him. And I go out the other room and go, oh, God, what have I said? <laughs> oh, shit, what have I done here? Gone for it, six. That one, where's it gone? Straight in the air, it's another six. I could walk and I just, one of the gutsiest innings I've ever seen. The most extraordinary innings I saw in my career, without doubt. He's a genius. Fruit bat at times as well. And that's a beautiful stroke with which to make a maiden test century. It kind of just released all the pressure. He'd won as the Ashes. Just when needed. Last test match of an Ashes series. And so Bad Light has stopped play, but we're short of the time at which the game can officially be called off. I think that's bothering the crowd. One iota, the champagne bottles have been opened. Slight anticlimax for the players. They will remember this moment for the rest of their lives. We were in the changing room. The game had been called off, but no one in the public knew. So we had about probably five, ten minutes before anybody knew what was going on. And I remember just dancing around, jumping about and singing. It's all tied perfectly. There it is. England have regained the ashes. And it ended with the umpires lifting the bales. It was such an anti-climax. I had to walk into the opposition change rooms without feeling like we'd given up a fight. You know, the game had been called off and we 
here's me saying, well done, mate, you've, you've got the Ashes back. It didn't really hit me for a few years. It's kind of now that I sit back and go, God almighty, we beat a good team. And then us doing a lap of honour around the ground and actually feeling quite faint, like, you know, this is really surreal for me now. Sitting on that oval balcony and England are going mad and they've won the Ashes back and that's like, oh, that is a stagger. It's the most disappointed I've ever been, ever. Captain handing over the Ashes. And I'm not sure if it gets much worse than that for anyone. We just lost the Ashes. I was in New York, went to a United Nations meeting, and Tony Blair was there. And the then president of Pakistan, Purvis Musharraf, came running over to me and he said, John, don't worry, we will avenge you. <laughs> <laughs> he said that. There was no getting away from their adoring public today. This England team now catapulted to pop group status. I was remember going back to the hotel looking at Freddie and said, Freddie, you remember in the morning, nine o'clock, suit and boot, we've got to get on that bus ride. I just remember him looking at me at about 3.34, pissed at the and he went, no fucker will turn up. One of the best lines I've ever heard was from Freddie. He said, what did you have for breakfast? He said, a cigar. You get to Trafalgar Square, again, there's thousands of people lining up. OK, I'm still buzzing because this is great and this is so enjoyable, but I'm just starting to feel a little bit ropey now. And then heading to Downing Street to meet the Prime Minister with a load of guys less than sober was, was never going to end well. What was it? Was it a late night, was it? It was, um, if I say a few of the players haven't slept as yet. I'll let you decide all. which ones. Right. The level to which this country lost the plot about winning the Ashes in 2005 tells you how important it was to win the Ashes. And it actually took the country by the sort and colours. It really did. You could argue probably not great for English cricket because I think it was almost inevitable that we got caught up in our own publicity. To be a truly great team, you have to do it time and time again over a long period of time. Australian meat and livestock, they had this great idea for the Australia Day lamb campaign. Richie. Cookie, where are you? Uh, don't know. What's up? Can you make an Australia Day barbie at my place? Bit of cricket, couple of lamb chops. You in? Yeah, all right. And he was inviting all these people, and I ring him up and say, Richie. Two for 22. Australia Day barbie at your joint, I hear. Nope. Nope. And he hangs, <laughs> he hangs up on me. Welcome back to the Gabba. Players and umpires have made their way out to the centre and all looks to be in readiness now for this first Ashes Test match of 2006. Definitely Richie Beno was the backbone of pretty much all the 12th man records. In early 2006, there was such expectancy and anticipation about that series, I just thought doing something around this Ashes series would be a good thing to do, so I did. Good morning, Bull. Good morning, Tony. Good morning, all. One of the most keenly anticipated series in a long, long time, and it should be, as Australia goes about reclaiming the trophy that's rightfully theirs, the Ashes. Well, Bull, you certainly haven't wasted any time in nailing your colours to the mast with that biased assessment, but be that as it may, Andrew Strauss now facing the first ball. God, is it first ball of day, a thin edge. And Andrew Strauss just lets that one go through to the keeper. You'd better calm down a bit, Bull. There's a long way to go here. <laughs> well, every time, every time we play, that Greggy and I run into a wall in the car. <laughs> Tony said unequivocally, you made me a bloody star. You put an extra zero on my off to do the speaking fee. Tony had Billy burning him on the phone. And he was saying, oh, hey, Billy, make sure you send me a couple of those DVDs. You really are quite telly, aren't you, Bull? Very much on edge. Fucking oath I am, Tony, and why wouldn't I be? The tension, the drama, the buzz, it's all happening already. Fuck, Bull, it's only the third ball. Will you calm down a bit? No, I won't, Tony. Blow it out your ass. I'll do what I want, how I want. 
And we're going to have some part-time soap dodger like you telling me how to do my job. Brilliant, brilliant. You still laugh now. It's really funny, really, really funny. You had cricketers absolutely wet in your pants. They were often a big part of our touring teams. Absolutely brilliant. You know, you've got to bring a little bit of fun. You've got to try and sell the game. Two things in Australia, we, we, we love watching sport and we love taking the piss. And it was something that brought people together, gave them a good laugh. And God knows a good laugh is hard to come by these days. I don't think Chapelli's as big a fan. Excuse me, Rich. Yes, uh, what's happening, Chapelli? Has the slaughter come to a halt yet? Um... Excellent, Ian. A marvellous effort, that. I don't think Ian ever said anything, did he? Oh. <laughs> I hope Chaps doesn't watch this. <laughs> is on fire. Those guys that were mixed up in the 2005 series, they, they were hurting. And they wanted redemption from that, I can tell you. Got him! There it is! Wicket number 700! We wanted to smash the bomb. We just wanted to smash it. Catch! Goes. Goes again. Oh, that sounded superb! Going to be the first century. The second fastest in the history of Test cricket. If they'd have come at us like they did in 2005, it probably would have been a punch-up, would have been a full-on melee. But we were ready for that series, mate. And what a hundred that is from Ricky Ponting. He's had to live with losing the Ashes. I don't care where we play them right now, no-one's going to get near this team for the next few months. And that anger came out in 6-7. It was like, we're going to rub your noses in it. That night, Andrew Flintoff, James Anderson and Steve Harmison came into our room. Right, boys, time for the song. Mate, this is legendary. We want to be in for it. This is England captain. They want to sing. I'm going, mate, Barco, you're out. One of the Barney Army goes, that was an absolute disgrace. You should be ashamed of yourself. Uh, I've never felt lower. What'd you say to him? Tell him to fuck off. <laughs> The series since 2005 have been remarkable. Over the period, you'd mark England as the marginally better side. A lot has changed in English cricket behind the scenes since 2005. I think we have had a slight better of it over the last 10 years. So. You know, you get people come up and start nailing you about losing, but it's like they think that we don't care. It's probably the opposite of that. We probably care too much. England have had the better of it. Australia produced an amazing 5 0 whitewash from nowhere, driven by Mitchell Johnson's bowling. That fall, it's fast, and it's Viper. Mitchell Johnson, what a series he's having. 28 wickets. As Hadge just said to me, we, uh, we got him back, so it's a fantastic feeling. And England made you work for it today, too. Yeah, it certainly wasn't given to us easy, but we expect that. We've known from day one that, you know, playing against England's always tough. Ashes series is where people will gauge the health of the cricket in your country, deliver or expect some pretty harsh criticism on the back of it. Two things matter. You've got to give people an equal opportunity to play the game and you've got to ruthlessly reward merit. And I think the fact that you're getting more women playing cricket has changed the game for the better. When I was younger and growing up, I watched a lot of Ashes cricket. I don't think there's any other contest like it. It's true test match cricket in its most competitive form. It's probably since 2005, watching the men's Ashes, I've always thought how special it would be to, to win an Ashes, and I remember feeling quite emotional when I knew we'd finally got our hands on that trophy. This really important era, I guess, of, of women's cricket and women's sport around the world, there's a really strong fight between our nations to lead the way in that sense. For some reason, whenever you play Australia, everything seems to be worth more. Unless you've played in it, you won't be able to explain that feeling of walking on the pitch playing against the Australian team. Nothing in sport creates identity like the Ashes does. It's the identity of the two countries and the fact that they love each other and hate each other all at once. It was almost about who's the better country. If you've got the Ashes, you're the better country. 
the cricketing relationship between England and Australia has contributed to the political and social relationship between the two countries. I think cricket binds. It's one of those relationships that has its hot and cold periods. Some of the patronising attitude of some of the English to Australia and some of the chip on the shoulder of some of I think it's gone. But don't underestimate the almost father-son sort of intensity of competition. Is certainly the most important series and the one you want to play in and the one you want to do well in. It can be a roller coaster ride, test match cricket. As soon as you throw the ashes on top of that, it gets emotional. It's giving me goosebumps sitting here now. What matters to me is playing for the flag. When they hand you those sweaters, it's quite an emotional bit of time. The deep lying history with the convicts adds a little bit into the mix. That's why the kind of the friction with the history works. And it's a common thread. That's a tie that will be there forever. And we act like we're the biggest enemies in the world, mm. but actually, I haven't met one bad one yet. The amount of times we walk down the street and some bloke just comes up and goes, just make sure you beat the Poms. Just make sure you beat the Poms. That's all we're asking. And we're like, mate, we're doing our best. Reputations, there's no, no doubt, are, are built and forged on what you do in Ashes cricket. Wonderful victory, wonderful hussy. There's nowhere to hide. You can either swim or you can sink. Two great teams, two great nations. We've just got to make sure that we preserve it. The biggest rivalry in, in world cricket, there's no doubt about that. The rivalry forged in fire. The whole point of the matter is that we were supposed to be sent here as convicts, as the dickheads, and the only dickheads are the ones that stayed there. Well, I've got a couple of convictions, so I suppose I could be an Aussie. <laughs> the rest of them. We'd love to live over here, then, in that shit hole. What you should get from us, in large doses, is sophistication and class. You go there for two or three weeks, it's great. You get a bit of sunshine, you can think, oh, get some. These others are a pain in the ass. We don't get skin cancer. We don't get animals that could kill you. Hugely proud to, to be English. Do you count England and Yorkshire as the same thing? Or I was going to come on to that, actually. <laughs> I'd just like to thank England for colonising Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever stole that loaf of bread and got transported out to Australia, well done, mate. Absolutely fantastic job.